Hello there, Washington County Library and Miss Erica, who was so kind to invite me to do a virtual show for you guys. My name is James Reynolds, and I am the Planetarium Director at Elizabeth City State University in Elizabeth City. Uh, we run the Con Planetarium uh, there, which we're not at right now. Uh, actually, we're using uh, some different software uh, because this is a virtual show. And... Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the night sky, talk about some tales from the night sky, some interesting stories. I'll give you some tidbits. Well, I'll be here about 35, 45 minutes, something like that at most. Um, we do a lot at the planetarium. It's not just a uh, night sky simulation. Uh, we use this as a, a, in a way, sort of like a movie theater and as, in a way, sort of, maybe something uh, that a library would consider a resource, a media resource. Uh, we can show films, which are special films designed to be shown on a, on a dome. So it surrounds you 360 degrees. We also have educational modules. So we can, uh, for example, we have uh, for our biology students, people that might become doctors or um, surgeons or other types of things that involve the medical profession. Uh, we have a human model that we can uh, pull up and say they're studying, I don't know, the, something about the heart or the nervous system. Uh, we can bring up a, a human being and pull away the skin and strip them down to just the skeleton and circulatory system, whatever we're t discussing. And it's very, very accurate. Uh, it's huge. It's like in front of you and rotates and all this stuff. It's really, really neat. Uh, we can... Um, feed it directly into the United States Geological Survey, uh, the USGS, and watch earthquakes happen in real time. Uh, we do a lot with uh, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, we have a really cool uh, way to monitor uh, climate on Earth in real time. So you sort of have this floating uh, earth in front of you with wind speeds or how many wildfires are going on and all this stuff. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, sometimes I sneak in there on the weekends during the fall to watch college football. Um, so I can do, uh, I can show like YouTube videos. I can show these cool movies. We can simulate the night sky. We can have these education modules. Uh, we can do like optical illusions. Uh, we can do neat vector graphics. I have uh, these beautiful classical music uh, videos that you can just sit back and relax and listen to this music and see like kind of like uh, fractal images. And so there's a lot of cool stuff. Our films are are pretty varied. Um, we have films that you know you fly through the rings of Saturn or you might follow a photon from the center of a star all the way through a telescope, down through a person's eye and into the uh, occipital lobe of their brain, which is where it's at the back of your head, and that's where your brain processes visual information. Um, so we use the, the, plan, the con planetarium for quite a few different tasks. Uh, we do have these traditional roles that the uh, planetarium has and uh, one of which is looking at the night sky. And that's something that, that is really cool about astronomy is that the night sky we see is the same night sky that the Neanderthal people saw. It is the same night sky that most figures from all of human history, at least known human history, as far back as our written records go, which is a, anywhere uh, four to 6,000 years, maybe a little further back, but not much more than that. But People like us have been around for 200,000 years, uh, so uh, it's kind of hard to, to, to imagine, but they saw essentially the same night sky that we did. Now, the planet Earth does wobble a bit uh, over time. Uh, I think it's a 26,000-year cycle. So what we consider the North Star now, Polaris, is, has not always been the North Star uh, during the uh, time that the pyramids were being constructed. Uh, the North Star was a star called Thurban, and that's in the constellation Draco, one of the oldest constellations. Um, in about, I think it's about 13,000 years, it'll be the star Vega, which is in the constellation Lyra, which will be out uh, this week. Uh, 
I see the uh, the three big stars for the uh, summer triangle are out in the evenings. Um, Vega, Altair, and Deneb. And uh, we'll talk about those in a few minutes. Now, you can see at the screen behind me, it's all sorts of stuff. We see that there are some constellations out during the day. The ancient people were well aware of this. They were not, uh, you know, uh, people that uh, were not able to reason. They were uh, every bit as intellectual and smart as you or I. Remember, these were societies that constructed very large structures. And these are things that cannot be done without higher mathematics, reason, engineering. Uh, so the ancient people, just because they didn't have electricity or little cell phones to stare at all day long, uh, they were very sophisticated, high civilizations. In particular, the, uh, the Africans in... Um, um, the Middle Eastern people. They were uh, constructing very large structures many thousands of years ago. And again, this, this cannot be done without high mathematics. At night, they didn't have, uh, at least as far as we know, they didn't have artificial light. Uh, so the night sky was very familiar to them. And their night sky was one of mostly fixed stars. And then there were other stars, and to the, uh, to the ancient people, anything in the night sky was a star. Uh, but there were five wandering stars. And these, these wandering stars followed the same path. They moved, but they didn't move very far. And it, it was perplexing to them, so they gave these uh, wandering stars a, a name, and the name of the wandering stars were planets. And then they gave the planets names. There's five visible moving stars in the night sky, or five planets, as we call them. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Those are all five planets that you can see with your own eyes without optical aid. So we now have... Uh, a night sky with fixed stars, standard constellations, for example, Cancer, Orion, Taurus, Cetus, Arandus. Um, and now for the ancient people, by the way, in, in Africa, Orion was called Osiris. And he rode the river Arandus, which you can see there on your screen. That constellation still exists. Uh, he was on a barge. The, we see Lepus, but they saw... Osiris riding a barge down the river Arandus. Uh, so some of the constellation names have changed. Uh, there are 88 officially recognized constellations. The International, International Astronomical Union, also known as the IAU, uh, are the uh, people that make those determinations. We use the standard Greek uh, constellations as our benchmark for the planet. Other cultures have their own constellations. The Chinese people have their own. Uh, many of the uh, Western African cultures uh, had their own set of constellations or uh, they saw patterns in the night skies and gave them names and gave stories associated with them. And this is true of all cultures, whether it is the, uh, the people of South America, the, uh, the Native Americans who lived in the, the plains, um, the ancient European tribes. Uh, it sounds odd to hear that, but there were once just tribal people walking around Europe, the... Uh, the Rus, the burglars, the Finns, the Francs. Um, then there are the Aboriginal people of uh, Australia, uh, the people that, that walked the, uh, the vast continent of Eurasia and Siberia, um, Mongolia. All of these, con uh, all of these uh, cultures had their, you know, they'd look up at the night sky at night and they'd see patterns and they would tell stories about these patterns. And that's something that, that we all share together. And that's one of the, I think, really, really neat things about astronomy is that it connects us to the past. It also connects us with our ancestors, all ancestors. And uh, that's a wonderful thing, I think. So here we have these, these wonderful uh, patterns in the night sky. And there's uh, some cool stuff happening this month. And uh, we will uh, sort of advance the clock here a little bit. 
So I'm using Stellarium, which is the software I use. Uh, it was actually recommended to me by a shuttle astronaut by the name, name of Dr. Don, Don Thomas. Real nice guy. He used to tell stories about going up in the shuttle Discovery. Uh, let's go ahead and advance the clock here a little bit. And I'll tell you a story while we're going on. Uh, Dr. Thomas used to tell about uh, that he doesn't didn't, I mean, he loved going up in the space shuttle. That was fun. He actually wrote a book. It's called The Orbit of Discovery. It's the name of the, uh, the book. And as you can see, by the way, as we're going along here, the constellations rise in the east and they set in the west, just like the sun. And you can see the sun following this path. We see here Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, all riding on the ecliptic, or we might also call this... Uh, What is it? The uh, zodiac. The zodiac. Excuse me. It took me a moment there. I'm, I'm 57 years old, and uh, I guess I'm getting a little bit slow in my my advanced old age. Uh, also, that yellow line here in the middle, that's sort of a greenish line, actually. This is called the meridian, and it's an imaginary line that goes from north to south. And in the morning, let's go. Let's back up here a little bit. We are we're a little bit before 4:30. And here we are at, at 12.26. The, uh, remember, we're on daylight savings time. But uh, when, the moon, uh, when the sun, the star we call the sun, is on the uh, eastern side of the meridian, we call this anti-meridian. So uh, when the sun passes that meridian line, hopefully you can see this. Yes, you can. Um, after that, it becomes post-meridian, or PM. This is where AM and PM come from. All right, so anyway, we're going to advance. I use military time here because it is uh, easier to figure out uh, what are called universal time coordinates. Uh, interestingly enough, if you travel outside of the United States, most countries use a 24-hour format anyway. If you go to to Europe or Africa or places like that. It's not 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's 1,500 hours. Uh, the U.S. is one of the few countries that still goes by these older, you know, 12-hour clocks. Uh, but that's just me complaining. We're going to continue advancing the time. We're now at 8, uh, 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, 9 o'clock. We'll set it for just 9 o'clock. Even, Stephen, there we go. And we're looking south at 9 o'clock. And I'm sort of pausing this for us for a moment. Uh, so I want to go back and make sure that you guys can see exactly what I can see. I have to adjust the picture slightly. There we go. We're looking south and uh, looking due south. And perfect. Could not be better. All right. So at 9 o'clock at night this evening, if you were to go outside and look south, and you could certainly download your own... Um, Compass program, if your parents allow you to have a cell phone, or you could get an inexpensive um, compass at uh, the camping section of uh, Walmart. I was going to say Montgomery Ward, but that will really age me. Uh, Walmart or some other sporting goods store. Uh, and if you, you can't afford a compass or can't download one, most satellite dishes point towards the south. That does not mean that they point perfectly south, but they point in a southerly direction. So here we are looking south-ish uh, at 9 o'clock at night. And if you were to do this, you would see a pretty bright star, kind of a reddish star over there. And that would be a good way to figure out where this constellation is. This is called uh, Antares. Antares is a beautiful star and it is in the constellation Scorpius. Okay, Scorpius uh, is one of the few constellations that really looks like what it is. Uh, Antares though is uh, means it's really anti-Aries. All right, so who is Aries? Aries was the Roman name for Mars, so it means anti-Mars or rather not Mars. If you were to look here in the southern skies, you might mistake an Antares for Mars. It is not Mars. Mars is actually quite close to Venus right now, as a matter of fact. And uh, if I backed up the time just a little by, whoa, 
There we go. Uh, Venus is setting. If you have a clear view of the western sky, uh, right around sunset, you could find Venus and Mars pretty doggone close together. There's Mars and Venus. Uh, they'd be very low in the western sky right around sunset. Um, real cool to see. And there's Venus. We're going to close in on it. Venus is a... Oops. Holy smokes. It flew off on me. It's not supposed to do that. Uh, what we're doing, we're looking at such a small area of the night sky that it, it, it moves rather quickly. So uh, that's all right. But Venus is a uh, planet enshrouded in clouds. It's quite hellish. Uh, very, very, very hot there. Metal turns into liquid there quite quickly. Um, but the reason it's so bright and shiny is that it's covered in clouds. And, of course, then we also see Mars, which is a beautiful sight in a telescope. Uh, especially if we can catch it at the right time of year. Take a look here. We could, uh, if we put a yellow filter on our telescope, we would be able to see the polar ice caps, and we should be resuming normal operations at the Khan Planetarium at the university uh, this fall. So we will have evenings where we'll set up a whole bunch of telescopes, not just one. We'll have like five or six, and then you could come out and uh, look in the telescopes and see some pretty cool stuff. Uh, one thing I'll tell you right now, you won't see these gorgeous purpley, red, yellow stuff. Uh, when you see deep sky objects in a, in a telescope in real time, it looks more like smoke. It's more like black and white pictures. Uh, so don't, don't be terribly disappointed. Anyway, so if you're wondering where the planets are, now something that uh, you should notice, though, where are these planets located? What are they right near? Well, they're near the moon, for one. The moon will be, uh, just uh, as a matter of fact, the moon will just be in a, in a waxing crescent stage. Waxing. This is how you remember it. A moon builds up towards a full, full moon. Wax builds up. So we are in a waxing crescent followed by a waxing um, gibbous stage. And then we go to full moon. Then we go to waning gibbous waning crescent, and then we go to new moon. So if you could find the moon right now, it would be in a uh, look like a, a very thin sliver, something like something out of a storybook. But these are all close to the ecliptic, which is what we were discussing a few minutes ago. The ancient people knew that the moon, the sun, and planets, those wandering stars we talked about a little while ago, could only be found in one section of the sky, and they followed a predictable path. All right, so we are backing up here a little bit more. So let's go ahead and advance to about 9 o'clock because that's pretty. And we see some uh, beautiful stuff out here. So what's going on? What are we seeing? Now, I have all these deep sky objects marked, and I just uh, got to uh, turn them off here. I'm going to turn them off real briefly. So at least we have them. Oops. Now there's a... I had a terrible time doing my last show a few minutes ago, and uh, there we go. Let's see. That, yeah, I think that took. Yeah, there we go. So we're gonna we're just gonna take the labels off here real quick, just so we can see. I want to switch back to my view, so I can tell that you guys are seeing what I see. There we go. So when we see um, Sagittarius and Scorpius, there's a story here. What's going on? Well. All right, we remember, most people remember Orion. That's a, uh, Orion is a winter constellation. We, we tend to see him mainly during the winter at convenient times. Although if you get up at the right time in the summer, uh, Orion is visible. But Orion and Sagittarius, they were buddies. You know, they, they used to hang out together and watch sporting events and things, even though Sagittarius was a centaur. Uh, Sagittarius had the, the, the lower half of a horse and the top half of a human. And Scorpius, of course, is a scorpion, so we can, we can actually add that in there, so we can take a look. And uh, there we go. There's old Scorpius and Sagittarius. Okay, so Sagittarius. Now look, Sagittarius is trying to do something bad, though. He's, he's got an, a bow and arrow. He's, he's getting ready to shoot Scorpius. What's the story here? Well, number one, um, centaurs are notoriously poor guests and uh, they tend to drink too much. But uh, what's happened here is that uh, Orion, who was a uh, 
he was a demigod. He wasn't quite immortal, but he had he had god blood in him, and so he was extra strong. And he was he claimed to be the best hunter in the world, and there was no animal on the planet that he couldn't hunt and kill. Well, uh, turns out the scorpion was able to sting Orion and kill him, and. Uh, Sagittarius, the uh, centaur here, he's, he's taking his revenge. He's getting ready to, to, to shoot that scorpion with his arrow and, and get, you know, kill off the scorpion. Uh, this is the reason that Scorpius and Orion are on opposite ends of the night sky. They're never together. So that's sort of a cool story there. Uh, Sagittarius is a neat constellation, though. It's a, I'm going to take this artwork off. There we go. Put that back. Uh, and we'll go ahead and... Uh, Return our deep sky object labels. It gets a little confusing, but if we can find Sagittarius, which again is in the southern sky, uh, over here, let's advance the night just a little. We'll stay up a little later than normal. There we go. Starting to get nice and dark, and we should start seeing some fun stuff over here. So let's see here. Yeah, there we go. We've got the uh, Lagoon Nebula is above Sagittarius. This is uh, and the Trifid Nebula. It's trying to get them both in there. So let's back back out a little bit. If you imagine Sagittarius as a teapot, and uh, pull him up a little bit here, we'll get a better view. There you go. You can start seeing the teapot shape. Actually, and that's where that little song comes from. I'm a little teapot, join us. Uh, that's the steam coming out is the Milky Way, which I've actually uh, taken away here because I really didn't want to have it in the way. And, of course, uh, I will go ahead and temporarily pause. And we're back with the Milky Way. It has uh, now been superimposed back here, and we can see if we take a look at Sagittarius, there does appear to be steam coming out. So we got the song. I'm a little too punk, Jordan, and stuff. So that's where it all comes from. And when we see Sagittarius, that's a great constellation, mainly because we're looking at towards the center of the, 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 the galaxy. And so when we look over here, there's all sorts of cool stuff going on. This is a wonderful area of the night sky to aim your binoculars at night. You can see the Lagoon and Trifid Nebulas beautifully. They're fun. Lots of neat stuff to find here. If you're looking, and I'm going to go ahead and I can turn off all that stuff. There we go. And doesn't that look nicer? It's not quite as busy. But the, this is actually towards the black hole, this region of the sky, uh, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Uh, so we are also going to uh, start looking around here a little bit more because uh, I've kind of been poking around here. And uh, let's see, we're going to take the atmosphere away for a minute and just stick to the constellations. Now, uh, we're looking in the uh, south-southeast sky, and uh, we talked a little bit about Sagittarius and Scorpius. Uh, they, again, do lie on the uh, ecliptic, uh, but we're going to uh, look over here a little bit more. And by the way, uh, we'll go ahead and look in the eastern sky. There is something that we see here, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, but we're going to try. Let's see here. Yes, there we go. The summer triangle is out. I'll make sure that you guys can see that. Just I need to adjust this just slightly. There we go. You can see this now. If you look to the east and up, you will see three bright stars uh, made up of Deneb, which is in the constellation Cygnus, Vega, which is not, it was a really lousy car in the 70s. Uh, I sold a lot of them. And uh, Vegas in the constellation Lyra, the harp. And then we have uh, Altair, which is the constellation Aquila, the eagle. Uh, Aquila was, uh, you didn't want to run into Aquila. Aquila was the uh, god's enforcer. Uh, if you did something really bad, they'd send Aquila to, to punish you. Uh, so you didn't want to, to get a visit from them. Uh, but the other one that I really like over here, this is a cool constellation, uh, Lyra the Harp. And uh, it is, um, this is where we find the Ring Nebula. Let's see if I can get it to come out. There it is. All right, it's very, very, very difficult to find. 
Okay, so we have Vega. I'm double checking to make sure you guys can see the same thing as I have. Yes, Vega is there. And on the opposite side between Sheliak and Salafat, uh, keep in mind, uh, many of these names are either uh, Northern African or Middle Eastern in origin, and they do not come off of my tongue very well. Uh, the Sheliak, though, I, I remember that from, the cons, uh, from uh, Star Wars, not Star Wars, Star Trek. I remember an episode. But uh, in between Sheliak and Salafat, uh, right there, and I'm going to try and get this enlarged a little bit. Let's see if you guys can see this here. There we go. There is something right there that you can't see, but a very good telescope will. I know right where it is. All right, so what do we see here? It's called the Ring Nebula, and it is way cool. So we're going to go ahead and center and enlarge. Make sure you guys can see the same thing. I'm going to recenter this up a little bit and make sure. Yeah, there we go. So let's go ahead and enlarge. This is a deep, deep sky object. It does not look blue and red when we see this in our telescopes. It looks more like a cigarette smoke ring. I don't know if you've ever seen someone make smoke rings with a pipe or a cigar or anything, but it's, it's kind of cool. Anyway, that's sort of what it looks like. Uh, so uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You cannot see this with binoculars. You have to have at least a 10-inch telescope. Uh, and we have one at the uh, university. So you are more than welcome to come and visit us, and we will be delighted to show you the Ring Nebula, provided it is available for viewing that night. Uh, not all the constellations are always visible at convenient times. In astronomy, sometimes we have to get up at very weird times if we want to see something, or you have to wait till a certain time of the year to look at your uh, night sky objects. The reason for this is the uh, planet that we live on uh, orbits the star we call the sun, and because of our orbit, uh, at certain times of the year, we can see certain constellations and uh, different uh, deep sky objects. So anyway, that's where we find the Ring Nebula, and this is a very famous asterism here called the Summer Triangle, and you will be able to see these three uh, constellations, Cygnus the Swan, Alt, uh, Aquila the Eagle, and Lyra the Harp uh, for the f next few months at least. So we have some other cool stuff coming up over here, and one I always like to talk about is Queen Cassiopeia and King Cepheus and their daughter Andromeda. Okay. All right. So in our tale that we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, King Cepheus is apparently comes through without any problems. Um, Cassiopeia was a queen of Ethiopia, which is uh, south of Egypt in Africa. And uh, it, she was one of the most beautiful women to ever walk the face of the earth. She was just gorgeous. And she knew how pretty she was. And she liked to remind people of how pretty she was. She also had a daughter named Andromeda, and Andromeda will be joining us here in a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and increase the uh, time, and we will see Andromeda starting to clear the, the sky here. Uh, you might not be able to see exactly what I see because I'm not looking. Yeah, you're going to have, you're kind of hidden behind the clock here, uh, but just give me a uh, 2200 hours. Uh, She's almost up. She's just underneath. There we go. Andromeda's starting to rise. Perfect. There we go. So we'll pull this back a little bit here. And again, make sure. Yep, you can start seeing her rising. So here we have Cassiopeia and Andromeda. And uh, they're in the night sky there together. Uh, Andromeda was also a very, very pretty young lady. And uh, both of these women knew how beautiful they were. And they, they even bragged, this is their big mistake too, uh, they bragged that they were more beautiful than the daughters of Poseidon. Well, the daughters of Poseidon, they didn't like hearing this at all. And even though Cassiopeia, she was gorgeous, just as pretty as could be. And so was Andromeda, just, you know, strikingly beautiful women. Uh, they were not immortal goddesses. And the daughters of Poseidon, who were immortal goddesses, didn't like this one bit. So they went to Zeus, who's like Mr. Big. He's the head god. And uh, Zeus, he's sitting on his throne, and the, these, these uh, goddesses come up, and they say, Now, Zeus, Zeus, this is just wrong. 
we cannot have these 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 young ladies claiming they're prettier than than we are. We're the goddesses, and they're the mortal women. And Zeus sits up on his throne. And he's like, yeah, I, I I agree. There's something wrong here. So poor Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia, as beautiful as she is, she ends up being tied to her throne. And I, I will apologize. Uh, the artwork in this particular piece of software is not, culturally inaccurate. Uh, as you can tell, Cassiopeia clearly does not appear to be from the country of Ethiopia. Uh, but anyway, um, here she is looking in a mirror at her face, and she's in a throne where she will eventually end up upside down tonight. And this is not a good thing. Andromeda, on the other hand, ends up, uh, she's chained to a rock. You can see there that, uh, that uh, she has something going across her waist there, and that's not cool. She's actually chained on a beach, and there's this monster. His name's Cetus, and he's coming out of the sea, and he's going he's gonna to eat her alive, and he's got bad breath and red eyes and all this terrible stuff. Well, uh, Andromeda's uh, boyfriend, Perseus, who's right there to the, to the left of her, you can see him in his helmet, he shows up and saves her, kills the monster, and they go home, and they're all happily ever after. <clears throat> I realize this does sound rather antiquated and something that we wouldn't really hear too much today, but uh, remember that the uh, constellations stories we're hearing are many, many thousands of years old, and they are, uh, it's hard to, uh, how can I say, we don't want to superimpose our own set of uh, beliefs and morality on something from many thousands of years ago. Uh, however, uh, I do like to make sure that that's acknowledged. Now, if we can find Cassiopeia and Andromeda, and here's an easy way to do that, all you have to do is really find a great square of Pegasus. And I'll back this up a little bit. I should be able to uh, see this yourselves. Yeah, there's the great square of Pegasus. And uh, Pegasus and Andromeda sort of occupy the same, they sort of borrow from that square. But in between Cassiopeia and Andromeda is something that you can see with binoculars. And it's one of the neatest things to see. You can also see this with your own eyes. It's called the Andromeda Galaxy, and it is the only galaxy you can see with your own eyes. You just need, know, need to know where to find it. And on a dark, moonless night is what you need. So if you go to the end of Andromeda's chain is where it is. It's right, oops, Bossy. There we go, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, here what you see, this is about what you would see on a good moonless night. There's a little smudge there. Now, if you had binoculars, though, Binoculars, this is where binoculars are better than telescopes. I'll go ahead and increase the, uh, there we go. So in binoculars, you would see something sort of kind of like this. It's beautiful. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous sight. And binoculars are cheap. You can get a pair of binoculars for next to nothing. Um, or borrow a pair. Or come to one of our star parties, and you too can see the Andromeda galaxy with your very own eyes. Uh, it's a beautiful, breathtaking sight. Uh, so that's uh, something that you, you can see for yourselves. And, uh, you know, we can even get closer to it. There we go. Uh, double check to see how much longer I've been. I've got a few more minutes to go. Uh, so there it is. You can see these dark areas are what are called dust lanes. Those uh, are the areas. Space is not free of, of, it's not this sterile environment. There's a lot of dust and garbage floating around out there. Not garbage like we think of garbage, but just dust and soot and uh, gases and, and various atoms. Um, but that is a beautiful, beautiful thing to see in the night sky. Uh, so what else do we got going in the night sky? So we've seen a couple easy things to see. If we get over to the east, though, there are a couple of old friends hanging out here. Uh, and this is at about a little after 11 o'clock, about 11.15. In the east-southeast, Jupiter is starting to rise. So if you were to go out there and look in the east-southeast at around 11.15, around the, uh, the uh, horizon, you would see a very bright, it looks like a star, but it's not. It's Jupiter. And a decent pair of binoculars would reveal a disk and several of the, of the uh, larger moons. 
of uh, Jupiter and a small telescope, even a crummy one from a like a department store. Toy store, toy store telescopes can even reveal some of the cloud bands on Jupiter. It's really not hard to to see that. But if you hold binoculars very steady, you can see them as well. And some of the uh, larger moons like Europa or Callisto, uh, Ganymede, Io, those are the larger moons. So there's that to see in the night sky. And uh, then if we back up, and again, note that Jupiter is near this red line we've talked about so much already. The ecliptic or the zodiac. The ancient people were well aware of this. And by the way, Jupiter is in Aquarius right now. And for those of you who are Aquarius in the horoscope, uh, yeah, just like me, I'm an Aquarius too. I'm very disappointed every year. It's a really hard constellation to find. It's not, not easy, and it's very faint. It's disappointing. So uh, one a little to the uh, west of Jupiter is Saturn. Another beauty. Now, if you look at with good binoculars, uh, you'll just see a planet that looks funny. Uh, the funny part is the rings. Uh, your binoculars are probably not powerful enough or have enough resolving power. It's not magnification with telescopes. It's resolving power. That's the important thing. Uh, my my uh, astronomy club does a telescope buying workshop every November right before Christmas. Because every Christmas we get all these people who have crummy telescopes for gifts and they come to us wanting to know why they won't work. Anyway, so here in the middle of Capricornus, which by the way is a swimming goat. Uh, it was uh, Zeus was trying to uh, uh, find yet another girlfriend. Zeus was married to Hera, but he, he was never satisfied. He always wanted more and more girlfriends. So uh, he was actually disguising himself as a water goat to... Uh, get to the other side of a river to uh, go on a date with a young lady. And uh, so that's where Capricornus comes from. Anyway, so if we uh, zoom in here on uh, Saturn, there we go. And I think I remember how to do this. Oh, wait, that's it. There we go. If you had a very small telescope, that is what Saturn looks like. Even a cheap department te store telescope, that's what Saturn looks like. Which, most of the problem with the cheap telescopes is not that they're bad telescopes, it's that the tripods they sit on are wobbly. So you can't get a, a, a good image, a steady image. Uh, so what we always recommend to people is get like a... Uh, uh, a quart of milk, one of those plastic jugs that you put in a recycle bin. They have a little handle, not the gallon ones, the, the thinner ones. And fill it with sand or water and tie it to the bottom of the, the uh, telescope tripod. And it pulls the telescope down and makes it more stable. And then you can uh, use these uh, telescopes. Uh, the cheap telescopes tend to be better for uh, solar system objects like planets, uh, comets, things like that. Whereas the deep sky objects you need to get in some serious optics. So uh, this is, again, uh, sort of a cheap telescope. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with cheap telescopes. There's lots of them. There we go. And that's probably, that's about what you'd see in about a 10-inch scope. I always remember the first time I saw Saturn, and everyone always remembers the first time they saw Saturn. And it always seems so lonely to me, just sitting out there by itself. But it's actually not all that lonely. There is a great big jumbo moon there. There we go. This one, it is about, if you can see Saturn, yeah, it's in the upper right-hand area about 1 o'clock. If Saturn was at the center of a clock, it would be at 1 o'clock. You might even think it's a, a blotch on your screen, but that's uh, the moon Titan. And Titan is the only moon in the uh, solar system where we know that there is a uh, thick atmosphere. It's, it's actually sort of like primordial Earth. And the cool thing is, you know, I think everyone's heard about uh, the United States and China and uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, all have missions to Mars right now. Uh, China and the U.S. have uh, rovers and the United Arab Emirates have a orbiter. Um, and the U.S. has a couple of orbiters going too as well. Uh, but... Some years ago, uh, we had the Cassini mission to Titan, which was a joint uh, 
project between uh, the United States and the European Space Agency. Well, we landed on Titan, and you, there are websites. Uh, if you go to the Cassini mission homepage, and I'm sure um, that your librarian could assist you with this, uh, you can look up the Cassini mission to Saturn, where you can look at photographs of the surface of this moon of Saturn. Now remember, Saturn is 800 million miles away. It's a long way away. <laughs> and uh, it's just amazing to me that we could do this. And it's uh, my favorite NASA mission. So that's something that I would strongly recommend looking up. Um, I'm also friends with the uh, man who took all the pictures of Pluto that came out a few years ago. Uh, those pictures were done with the uh, LORI camera, L-O-R-R-I, on the New Horizons space mission. And uh, that man's name is Steve Kennard. He's a friend of mine, lives around the corner from me, and that's all run from the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, also, there's the Space Telescope Science Institute here in Baltimore, uh, and they run the Hubble Space Telescope at, in conjunction with the uh, Greenbelt NASA headquarters over near the University of Maryland. So there's a lot of stuff. And by the way, if you're looking for a great career, there are gobs and gobs of opportunity with NASA. Uh, you know, just be sure to get good grades. Be sure to, uh, you know, stay out of trouble. Uh, if you get a security clearance at a young age, you will do well for yourself in life. And uh, working for NASA, you can do very, 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 very well for yourself indeed. So we'll, we'll leave uh, Saturn here. Uh, and hopefully you can join us sometime soon at the uh, Khan Planetarium. And we see Aquarius there. Aquarius was a, uh, uh, a shepherd boy, and his name uh, was, uh, wasn't Callisto, it was uh, Ganymede. Uh, and Ganymede was a, uh, uh, a shepherd boy who uh, our old friend, Aquila the Eagle, the enforcer, swooped down and carried Ganymede off. And uh, poor Ganymede ended up uh, he was sort of like the waiter to the gods. He would bring them wine or pour them water. This is why we have all these, these sort of water things. And interestingly enough, this time of year, we do have a lot of water constellations right over here. Capricornus, the water goat. Aquarius, the water bearer. And then Pisces, the fish is starting to, to rise. So we have three water-oriented um, constellations all coming up at the same time. And a lot of these uh, have stories that, like I said, Capricornus has more to do with Zeus finding himself another girlfriend to cheat on his wife with. Aquarius was the uh, water bearer. Pisces was uh, two fish. Uh, actually, it was uh, uh, Venus and one other god, Pan. I think it was Pan. Uh, Pan was sort of a mischief maker. Um, but there was a battle between the Titans and the Olympians, our, our familiar gods, Zeus and said, uh, Zeus and Hera and Apollo, uh, the usual characters, uh, were secondary. The Titans came before them, and there was a war between the Titans and the Olympians. And Pan and Venus, or Eros, if you were a Roman, um, they jumped into a lake or a river. Um, and didn't want to get lost from each other, so they tied a ribbon to keep their wrists together, and that's why we see Pisces as a pair of fish. So that's kind of another neat tale, but there's all sorts of cool tales up in the night sky. And uh, here's another good one, uh, Camelopardus. Okay, uh, I'm not going to tell you what that constellation is. You'll have to figure that one out for yourself or look it up with the assistance of your friendly neighborhood librarian. But I will tell you this. Here's a good hint. The, uh, this was seen as it was an animal. I'll tell you that much. It's an animal you might see at the zoo. And you might want to think about a combination between a camel and a leopard. What would that look like? So that's something that you can uh, put your... your your noggin looking together, and there are some other good ones here. Uh, but come out to one of our star parties soon. And if you have questions of any type, please don't be shy about emailing me. Uh, the Con Planetarium is part of the community, and we, you know, want us to be a resource for everybody. Uh, maybe you could bring your school, talk to your teacher or principal about coming this fall, or maybe if you uh, your school can't come to the 
to the university, maybe the university could come to you. You can contact me about those things. And I will look forward to hearing from you folks. Uh, I have sent um, your librarian a... Um, Ms. Erica has the uh, July night sky map, and she also has instructions. That's the last thing I wanted to say before I sign off. I forgot clean about it. Let's go back to our old friend, Sagittarius and Scorpius. We're going to uh, advance one night to the 13th, and we will go to 930, which is 2130. Actually, it starts at 2126. And passing just near Scorpius in the southern sky and moving higher uh, up past Ophiuchus and Libra will be the International Space Station. And that will look very bright. It, it's, it will look a lot like a, a plane that might, uh, uh, like a jet airliner, except it will not have the running lights. If you ever notice, planes always have uh, a red light on the left side or the port side of the, the craft or the naval vessel and on the right side will be green or the starboard side. Uh, so you've learned a lot today. You've learned about port and starboard. you learn about how to, to locate some constellations. You've learned some uh, constellation stories. Uh, you've got a little assignment to research Camelopardus, figure out what that is. And um, you know, you always have friends here at the Con Planetarium. I want to thank you all so much for being my audience, and I will hopefully uh, get to meet you guys in the very near future. Take care, and uh, remember, get out, look up, and enjoy the night sky.